I think this video contains some of the most important geoengineering information that you will ever see and this is absolutely essential that everybody watch the entire video to learn what is going on. Uh, this is the ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure west of California and I'm going to disclose this um, previously unknown weather control program of how this is maintained all winter long and what it's doing to the planet. So this presentation is called uh, How the Ridiculously Resilient Ridge and Polar Vortex are Maintained by what I am naming Differential Buoyancy Aerosol Spraying or DBAS and all this research has been done by me the HARP report with no funding or help from anybody else. For the last six years I have watched the ridiculously resilient ridge, the stationary permanent high pressure west of California, drag extreme cold air into the heartland of the USA every year beginning on November 1st. Meteorologists have puzzled over this for years and no one could figure it out, but finally on November 7th, 2019, I figured out how they are doing it. This video discloses the basic ideas of the technology which are being used to rapidly melt the Arctic and put the USA into a deep freeze every winter. In addition to runaway greenhouse gas emissions, which I do not want to minimize, this is a, a doomsday crisis for the planet, this hidden program is speeding up our extinction and removal from this planet. Why should you care if the Arctic becomes ice-free? When the ice is gone, the jet stream will become very weak or even non-existent in the summer. With no jet streams, polar or subtropical, if it rains at your house, it will rain for three months. If it is, not, if it is hot and sunny at your house, it will be hot and sunny for three months. Under those conditions, large-scale agriculture becomes impossible, or at best, a Las Vegas gamble. Extreme food shortages will be the norm after the Arctic, Arctic ice is gone. That is just the start, just the beginning, and why you should care about the melting Arctic. By the way, YouTube is suppressing my channel and my comments, so please share the links to this video. Please download and repost this video. No copyright is claimed on any of this research. The PDF is free to download. Look for the link in the description. So differential buoyancy aerosol spraying requires two different chemicals sprayed simultaneously from two tanker jets flying parallel at the same altitude. On the left we have dry powder aluminum sulfate which heats the air, the surrounding air, as the particles attract water causing the air to rise. On the right we have dry powder aluminum trifluoride uh, hydrate which cools air as particles, as the particles become wet and attract water, it cools the surrounding air, causing the air to sink. And please follow through to the very end of this presentation because I disclose how these chemicals were found, uh, which was a purely scientific reference. Let's have a quick look at the video history of the just the last month, which is all I have saved, and NSA has been deleting stuff off my hard drive all the time, and that's why I've put this particular video on the fast track before they can delete all my source material. And uh, also show the revelation I had seeing the candy cane of truth, which is what it looks like on Goes West Infrared, November 7th, middle of the night, 10.3 micron band. So October 13th, you can see the flow northwesterly from Asia, very warm, humid air, into Alaska. October 14th, October 15th, October 16th, October 19th, October 20th, October 21st, October 22nd, October 23rd, there's the 23rd, October 26, October 27, October 28, November 1st, November 2nd, November 3rd, November 4, November 5th, 
November 6th overnight, and this is significant, November 6th in the daytime. Now, as uh, the rainy season approaches California, they have to use more effort. So, November 7th overnight, but basically you get the idea that it sat there, it sits there for months, driving warm air into Alaska and northern Canada, and then you have plunging cold air coming down in the States. And this is the actual video that allowed me to uh, figure this out. It's because of this this candy cane shape here that basically it uh, gave away this the, the whole uh, shooting match. So let's go back to the presentation now that we've seen uh, this uh, stationary high pressure, how it refuses to budge months and months on end. So the operational characteristics of this program, tanker spray dry hygroscopic powder, so it's lightweight, you can carry a lot of it, and it absorbs water from the air once it's sprayed behind the plane. Different aerosol powders are sprayed in strategic locations to create horizontal roll clouds several hundred miles long. Air heating aerosol has a negative heat of solution. Air cooling aerosol has a positive heat of solution. So the spraying is done at night uh, after about three or four hours of darkness when the atmosphere is stable and predictable by the supercomputers and the Doppler radars. Powerful remote sensing and supercomputers are required. It took 15 years to get this program to work, to weaponize it, because it's very complex. This program leaves no daytime evidence of overnight uh, differential buoyancy aerosol spraying, except the white haze and the toxic chemical fallout. Natural clouds hide the operations from daytime infrared, from nighttime infrared satellite imagery, which I'll show you in a minute. DBAS complements the daytime use of ionospheric heaters for jet stream control. So the ionospheric heaters are operated by the Navy and their big Aegis ships and the SBX and this program is run apparently by the Air Force or some other classified organization. Supercomputer positions the aerosols to harvest natural energy from the frontal zone temperature difference. In other words, they get a natural en energy amplification if the supercomputer can detect r where exactly to spray these aerosols. So what does a stationary front look like in a good textbook? I have an American Meteor Meteorological textbook and this is their, s their version of the stationary front. And uh, you can see here you've got the uh, nimbostratus, the altostratus, cirrostratus, and cirrus clouds. And this area here is hidden by the cloud cover, why it's been so hard to detect for so many years. So let's simplify the diagram, looking north at a cross-section of the warm front. So to the left is Hawaii, to the right is California, and this the red line means it's a warm air mass. Warm, humid, buoyant air is trying to lift up. Cool, heavy, dry air is very stable and it's it's heavier so it stays at the surface. And we have, uh, again I say clouds hide the operational area. The internal winds in these two air masses can blow either direction. The uh, differential buoyancy aer aerosol spray can simply be reversed and no two air masses will ever be the same, they're just like a fingerprint. The supercomputer has to be able to cope with just uh, a huge number of variables to plan how to do this. The critical area is where the two air masses touch each other. This is called the frontal zone. So let's look at a detail of the frontal zone. And again, we're looking north over the Pacific. And the frontal zone is two flat sheets of air extending for hundreds of miles. And the red line is showing warm rising air. And it's a sheet that goes out very long distance and the, the blue is a sheet of cold air. This is where they meet. So because of the rising motion and the sinking motion, this is the natural convection and it's this swirling that produces the thunderstorm clouds in the cirrus. Now if we apply heating to the cooling aeros heating and cooling aerosols, 
we can actually cancel the natural rotation. The red dot is a heating aerosol, the, the blue dot is a cooling aerosol. So the, uh, it's, this is a long parallel string, and remember this is, we're looking at the, the front edge wise, so these are very long going into the page, sprayed by two separate airplanes. We have a heating zone on the cold side, and we have a cooling side on the warm side very long and they actually begin to rotate and form a roll cloud basically like a rollers pin that's a cylinder of air that's spinning horizontally. So uh, more and more of this is put in position uh, creating this man-made rotation of the frontal zone and the, the uh, differential buoyancy aerosol spray can extract more energy from nature than was contained in the powders. And that's why it took so long to make this work because of the supercomputer um, software and the Doppler radars and the satellite detection. So what does that the man-made frontal zone modification do to the movement of the large-scale air masses? And again, it's just a, a counter-rotation so the green arrows are the man-made airflow, and the black arrows are the natural airflow. These air movements cancel. The frontal zone is held static. The front can be held in place for weeks on end, as we see west of California, as long as this balance is maintained. So we've already seen a bunch of these videos. And this is the ideal position that they try to maintain with the ridiculously resilient ridge and the driver of artificial uh, polar vortex, the extreme cold. So this is happening every night over the Pacific. It's only visible in infrared. And as the California rainy season starts, it takes more energy, more effort, more intervention to keep these low pressures from reaching California. And again, these are long, long straight lines that appear basically after midnight local time. The DBAS is a, applied to the curve, the inflection point that has the strongest easterly push. While the USA has extreme cold, Arctic air spilling down all over it, this was actually last night, uh, what's happening in the Arctic? Alaska's current average temperature 31 degrees whereas you look at this cold area there's a lot of zeros I'd probably say it's about a 10 degree average so Alaska is 30 uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer while the USA has extreme cold Arctic air the uh, East Siberian Arctic Shelf is now 15 20 degrees centigrade warmer than normal this is this is the doomsday methane up here. And you can see the, the uh, blob, which is actually so warm it's killing salmon. And Alaska itself, very, very warm, maybe 5, 10 degrees centigrade warmer than normal. And here's the central U.S., minus 10, minus 15 centigrade. And this is a daily average, so it's actually worse than that. It was, a sum it was the warmest summer ever in the Arctic. June, July, and August have been never been this warm in the Arctic. Arctic islands are 8 degrees centigrade, that's about 14 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal. After the hottest Arctic summer on record follows the warmest ever fall. Arctic sea ice on track for second lowest record. So what are the results of maintaining stationary high pressure west of California? ridiculously resilient ridge. Warm, humid air is driven into the Arctic all winter long. The American sheeple are kept ignorant about the climate emergency, which is actually runaway global heating due to incredible levels of greenhouse gases emitted by our burning fossil fuel technologies. Drought, high temperatures, and fire in California. The warm water blob grows in the northern Pacific. Air over the USA is dehumidified in Canada decreasing the greenhouse effect over the central and eastern USA. Another way to hide the amount of uh, global warming that's going on over the US. 
This program kills ocean life by decreasing the upwelling off the California coast. You need a northern wind to uh, cause ekman transport and um, cause upwelling of nutrients, which causes the plankton to grow. One of the reasons the seals were starving a couple years ago. It melts the permafrost in Alaska, Canada, and the Yukon, and we already saw how warm the doomsday methane of the East Siberian Arctic Shelf is. California crops fail, reducing the food supply and quality, but the corporations get to cash in on Arctic oil and the Northern Passage. Russia is very eager to see a lot of ships uh, crossing through the Arctic Ocean. So here's the meat of the presentation. Which chemicals can be used for DBAS aerosols? What scientific criteria are needed for DBAS aerosols? How did I find the best chemicals? After hours of looking through uh, chemical handbooks, these are the best dry powder aerosols that I could find. There, there are several requirements to uh, selecting a good spray powder. First, it's got to be hygroscopic, meaning it's a dry powder, but once it's exposed to the air, it, be, it wets itself. Um, it, it pulls humidity out of the atmosphere and creates a solution. So in other words, the heat of solution is what uh, either cools the surrounding air or heats it. And hats off to Dane Wigington for harping about this for, you know, shouting for two years, because he's right. Th these are designer chemicals, incredibly toxic, that are being sprayed uh, in the manner that I showed. So I have a big reference library, and uh, you know the older books generally are the better ones. Now by Hess's law, the sum of the enthalpy, anyway, the heat of solution is equal to the heat of formation minus the heat content in the aqueous state. So nowhere can you find heat of solution in reference books very, very strange, if you ask me, unless it was intended to be classified early on and they don't want that information publicized. So here's, here's what you really want, is a table of the heats of solution. And then you can simply go through, you know, here's rubidium. Well, that's a, a very expensive, rare metal. You know, forget this. Here's cesium, again, uh, expensive, hard to find. Now this is um, potassium. Oh, there's lots of potassium around. But it has a very low heating and cooling uh, ability. So that's out. Now we have sodium. Uh, again, very low heating and cooling. Lithium is uh, expensive, only comes from China. There's a shortage of it already. Here's silver. Uh, very, you know, who's going to pay for that? Ammonia is mostly... Um, well, it, it has a low value of heating and cooling. And again, the hydrogen uh, acids, not suitable. So next. So this is the type of table that uh, I looked through. <coughs> and you can see, let me see. Okay, so this uh, delta F, this is the Gibbs free energy. If this is large negative value, then it will it will be hygroscopic and pull uh, water out of the atmosphere. So we first we're going to look for um, chemicals that have a large negative in this column. Next we're going to look for chemicals that are cheap. Aluminum is really cheap, and you want to see th something that's compared as a C and an AQ. That's crystal and aqueous. And we can look at here's the heat of formation in this column. The crystal heat of formation is minus 549. The aqueous heat content is minus 361. So this is huge. This is the highest. Aluminum trifluoride trihydrate. A super toxic poison, but it has about 180 heating uh, positive heat of solution. And again here, uh, aluminum sulfate go from crystal to aqueous. Minus 820 to minus 897. Very small, hard to read. Apologize. But we can go back to the original table. And so for cooling, we want a positive heat of solution. And here are all the others that I could find that were reasonable. And you can see nothing comes close. If you want to 
cool a long trail of air behind a top secret air air tanker you don't want to spray potassium nitrate which is fertilizer because number one potassium this is a fairly heavy molecule uh, how about uh, potassium brom bromate bromide only plus five potassium uh, how about potassium chlorate plus 10 you'd have to have 19 tanker jets to get the same uh, cooling as one tanker jet of aluminum trifluoride. This is a gigantic discovery right here. This explains why we are being so horribly poisoned by this white haze in the sky. Now for heating, there aren't any uh, superstars like the other one. Aluminum chloride, cheap, and it has a minus 80. Aluminum sulfate, minus 77. So these are the, your two main candidates because iodine is, number one, a heavy atom, and it's, it's expensive. And none of these others have a high value of heating. So this caused me to look up in the Sigma Aldrich Handbook of Fine Chemicals, uh, how toxic are these things? If, if they're being sprayed by thousands, maybe thousands of tons every day, how toxic are they? So this is the star, aluminum fluoride trihydrate. And the X means it's harmful or irritant. R is their risk, risk statements. And it's 22 through 36, actually 22 through 38. So here they are printed. Harmful if swallowed, toxic if in, inhaled, toxic contact with skin, toxic if swallowed. Uh, Contact with water liberates toxic gas. Highly inflammable acids liberate toxic, very toxic gas. Danger of cumulative effects causes burns, irritates the eyes, irritates the respiratory system. And then there's a safety statement, 26. It's just rinsing your eyes. So that's a bad, that is a bad chemical to have falling out of the sky. But a lot of people have these symptoms just from being outside in this white white milky sky so let's look at the uh so we that's the all-star nobody can can even come close to 188 kilojoules per mole so the next one aluminum chloride again it's a um this one has a different symbol it's corrosive the risk statement is 34 it causes burns but it has a lot of safety statements 28 through 45 and then 7 8 so it's very toxic if swallowed liberates toxic gas flammable danger of cumulative effects causes burns irritates the eyes irritating the respiratory system very danger of very serious irreversible effects well that's nice nice to have something like that fallen from the sky Risk of serious damage to eyes. Limited evidence of carcinogenic effect. So there's only limited evidence that it causes cancer. May cause sensitization by inhalation. Gee, that sounds familiar, okay. May cause sensitization by skin contact. Risk of explosion. May cause cancer. Ah, uh, there we go. Aluminum chloride. And then the uh, safety. Uh, yeah, the other safety statement is 7, 8. Keep container tightly closed and dry because it's hygroscopic. So now let's look at aluminum sulfate. You know, all three of these are really cheap chemicals. You know, the Aldrich uh, catalog shows you can buy aluminum trifluoride for, uh, I think it was, um, well, $100 for like two pounds or something. That's phenomenally cheap for a reagent. Aluminum sulfate, again, it's harmful or irritant. The risk profile 37 through 41, irritating to the respiratory system, irritating to the skin, danger of very serious irreversible effects. Oh, that sounds nice. Limited evidence of a carcinogenic effect. Limited evidence that it causes cancer. Risk of serious damage to eyes. The safety statements are 26 to 39. In case of contact with eyes, rinse immediately, okay. Take off your contaminated clothing, don't let it touch your skin, don't pour it down the drain. 
Oh, I don't even have a static discharge. Really, it's that flammable. Dispose of the container carefully. Uh, wear eye and face protection. Do they tell anybody to wear eye and face protection when they're spraying it over the Pacific, I wonder? Because I, I haven't heard that. So if any of my theory is correct, this explains why everyone is sick, why everything is dying, and why large amounts of aluminum have been found in creeks, lakes, soil, tree roots, etc. Aluminum is an extreme toxin to all living organisms and has no place in biological systems. It is a pure toxin because it is a small metal ion that has uh, the kind of electronic charge that that's similar to potassium, sodium, and calcium. And there are things called ion channels on the surface of all living cells, bacteria, plants, insects, mammals, that if aluminum gets into the bloodstream of an animal, these ion channels that are specific for calcium, potassium, uh, sodium cannot discriminate and the aluminum just pours into the cell and basically kills it. So it's a disaster to have any kind of metallic aluminum around, especially in the food supply. Also fluoride is another super toxin and it is probably falling from the sky in large quantities. All living things are killed by fluoride. If you if you have a question of that, take a, a, to a toothpaste, cut it open and put it where mice can find it. They'll eat it and they'll all die. It is an incredibly powerful toxin and has no place in uh, biological organisms. You know, it's not like chlor chloride, which is necessary. Fluoride is a deadly poison. These two poisons could explain the death of insects, birds, amphibians, and why all living organisms are in a death spiral. If you're a scientist, please use your training and lab resources to test this new toxic aerosol hypothesis. Our planet is dying rapidly, and we need new ideas and new eyes right now. This video has proceeded in a logical, step-by-step -step fashion to decode a very likely covert weather control technology. And what we have discovered is a grim reality, that extreme toxic chemicals are probably being sprayed by thousands of tons over our heads on a daily basis. We, our children, and all living things are being forced to ingest these merciless poisons with no possible way to avoid eventual deadly doses. This video is a wake-up call. Now is the time to act or die. I call for a total boycott on airline traffic starting in 2020. That is an essential first step if you and your children want to survive. Thank you for watching. Spread the word. Please help me spend more time on weather research. If you want to make a donation, uh, you can find my Patreon link. Thank you so much. Now, an important step. Relax, breathe deeply, think positive thoughts. There's still time to fight back as long as we organize and take the crisis seriously. Search for Roger Hallam, Extinction Rebellion. He has a real action plan. And listen to Dane Wigington on geoengineeringwatch.org. And thank you to Dane for exposing the, the exothermic and endothermic geoengineered aerosols. Uh, thank you so much, Dane. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for watching.